After this, they gathered together and proceeded to take counsel in regard to the remainder of their journey. And the first man to get up was Leon of Thurii, who spoke as follows. Well, I, for my part, gentlemen, he said, am tired by this time of packing up and walking and running and carrying my arms and marching in line and standing guard and fighting. And what I now long for is to be rid of all these toils, since we have the sea, and to sail the rest of the way, and so reach Greece, stretched out on my back like Odysseus. After hearing these words, the soldiers shouted out that he was quite right, and another man said the same thing, and in fact, all who rose to speak spoke thus. End quote. Hello there, and welcome back to Xenophon's Anabasis, book five of seven. And I like this book a lot. There are some really interesting leadership lessons and situations, and some really fun scenes, some really funny scenes, I think. And we get to know Xenophon and the men that he's commanding a little better herein. Have you heard of Diogenes the Cynic? He's the philosopher that was famous for living out in the open and doing all of his bodily business out in the open, preaching, living according to nature, you know, doing things like relieving himself out in public. Uh, well, Diogenes the Cynic was from Sinope, or Sinope, and we're going to meet some of his countrymen and the locals that might have influenced him in this episode. Sinope was a Greek colony along the Black Sea coast. But why don't we just get into it? I'm Alex Petkus. You're listening to The Cost of Glory, the number one ancient history, philosophy, success podcast, where it is our mission to retell the greatest Greek and Roman lives to help us win in the story of our own life. My main mission, as always, is to retell Plutarch's lives, to follow his book, The Parallel Lives. But in the course of my research and preparing these longer biographies, I do read a lot of other interesting ancient texts that I think are to the point of what we're trying to do here. So I'm sharing with you, as usual, my highlights here of Xenophon's Anabasis Book 5, what I think are the most interesting or shareworthy parts for you. Okay, so it's been a while since we've talked about Xenophon's Anabasis, the expedition of Cyrus, the book that he wrote, and just a sentence or two to remind us here of where we left off. If you recall, at the end of book four, having recovered from their local honey-induced hallucinations, Xenophon and the 10,000 mercenaries of Cyrus finally make it to the coast after marching through Babylonia, Assyria, Kurdistan, Armenia, and finally the mountains of what's now known as Trebizond, which is where they are now. now Trebizond is the region of Turkey on the southeast corner of the Black Sea. It's called Trabzon in Turkish, and it was later named Trebizond, or, you know, and later Trabzon after that, uh, after this Greek outpost town that the Greeks have just arrived at. It's called Trapezus. But the hinterland in most of the region in Xenophon's day, it's not Greek. It's barbarian, in their words, in, in the way that they... The Greeks call all of the non-Greeks just barbarians. It's not a derogatory term in their eyes, except that it's you know, a bad thing to be not Greek as opposed to being Greek in their eyes, of course. Uh, so now they're on the coast, uh, but it's still a very long and dangerous way to get back home to Greece. Most of these guys that are in the army are from mainland Greece, from places like Arcadia, Thessaly, Boeotia, Laconia, Corinth, Athens, of course, in the case of Xenophon. And it's about 750 miles as the crow flies to get to those places. So it's a ways, and yeah, they can ride boats there, but there are 10,000 or so of them. The number has actually dwindled at this point, as we'll see. That's a lot of men to transport on boats, it's not just easy to come up with that many boats who can take them all together, which is an important piece as we're about to see. So they're not done yet, and they're not in civilization proper yet. It's kind of like the Wild West, you might compare it, uh, but it's the Wild East here. You know, here and there, there's a Greek outpost. Technically, they're in the Persian Empire. It's an area that the Persians control very lightly, if at all. And the Persians are very, very far away. There's not really a central authority 
in this region along the coast of the Black Sea. Every tribe or people just controls whatever they can. So what are they going to do now that they've arrived at the coast? Well, they have a council. And uh, after they've had this speech that I just read you, that's the very beginning of book five. They all want to sail home if they can. Well, Chirisophus stands up. Do you remember Chirisophus? Chirisophus is their de facto first among equals commander. He's a Spartan. He's a senior guy. And Chirisophus stands up and he says, hey, I actually have a friend who is currently the Navarch of Sparta. He's the head admiral of Sparta, which now controls the seas. Uh, his name is Anaxibius. This is 400 BC when Anaxibius was the Navarch. And Chirisophus says, well, how about I go try to find Anaxibius and see what I can do about getting the Spartans to arrange for us to get back to Greece. And everybody likes that idea. And so they, they vote to approve that. And then Xenophon stands up to speak. And he says, basically, all right, we really need to be organized here. We're in hostile territory. There's been a lot of raiding and men are going out on their own. And there's a danger, he says, that many of you will perish if you set out after provisions carelessly and unguardedly. Uh, because, you know, the locals are starting to get a sense of what's going on. They've got a, a, an army in their backyards that is just basically going in and taking their stuff whenever they get hungry. Uh, so there's a lot of talk in the whole book and in this book in particular about setting out for provisions, that basically means raiding and plundering by force. So Xenophon proposes, let's have a new rule. If you're going to go out, you have to tell us where you're going and who's going with you. Because we need to know if you're going into hostile territory, we need to know where you're going so we can plan if anything goes wrong to come help you and defend you. And if you piss off the locals, then we need to be ready for the repercussions there. Our enemies are all around plotting against us. And everybody approves of this, but I think it's it's worth noting here that the speech is really addressed to this new problem that they have, which is namely that the sea gives them a new set of options and it really changes the leadership dynamic. There are these Greek cities along the sea. There's all kinds of ships sailing back and forth that they see now and then. Uh, the sea just kind of naturally gives the Greeks confidence. Men now see it as an option to desert, go off on their own. They can negotiate deals on their own with other Greeks, with other tribes. And the, the other dynamic that Xenophon is seeing here in this speech as he's seeing, okay, Chirisophus is going to go off. Well, there's kind of a power vacuum on the horizon here. Xenophon is good. He's a, he's a good leader, at least the way he depicts himself in this book. And I think it's probably fair to say that he was a good leader, but he's young. And you realize in this book especially that he's kind of been depending on Chirisophus a lot to shore up his own authority as a kind of subordinate. So I think in a lot of ways this book is kind of like a situation where the CEO of a company gets sick with some kind of long illness with an indefinite period of you know ending and he doesn't he doesn't clearly appoint someone in his place. At least it's not clear that Chirisophus does this. Maybe he did appoint Xenophon as a kind of subordinate guy to be in charge when he leaves, but this is not actually stated explicitly, which I think is interesting to keep in mind. So this whole chapter, they've got chaos on their door and you know they're, they're out of like hostile, being in hostile territory on all sides. Being on the coast, half of the span of vision is hostile territory maybe. And then the other half is just the sea, which is kind of like this psychological realm of infinite possibility. And very quickly, they, they see that uh, they can't rely on everybody to do what's right for the team. They send off one boat to try to negotiate on their behalf with a local city, a 50 oared boat. So maybe we're thinking 50 guys with a captain in charge. And the guys just leave. They just, <laughs> we're, we've got a boat. Let's get out of here. I mean, they can solve their own problem, right? So they're dealing with this kind of thing, and it's ramping up. So as they're waiting for 
Chirisophus, they start running out of supplies. They have to raid ever further and further. They get into the situation where they, some of them end up attacking a kind of a strong city and they get pinned in by the enemy. The territory is very rough. There's a ravine and Xenophon has to rescue them. And they end up like capturing most of a city for supplies, but then it accidentally gets burned down. It, it's a mess and it's getting difficult. Uh, so they finally decide we have to move on, even though we don't have Chirisophus. And they managed to get a few boats at this point, but not enough to take the whole army. So they're going to put their women and the weak and the old in the boats, and then the rest of them are going to go across on land. And Xenophon tells us, at this point, after this battle with these locals that they, um, that they ran in with, they've got 8,600 men now. So their numbers have dwindled. You'll recall it wasn't actually 10,000. It was more like 12 thousand at their at their highest point now it's 8600 men so they're setting out but before they go they've taken a lot of booty on their long journey the main one that they've taken is prisoners from their various engagements along the way and so they decide to sell their prisoners in the basically in the slave market of trapezus and here Xenophon goes on a digression that's really important for understanding Xenophon and also how this whole Greek world works. And there's, there's a really interesting takeaway, but I'll, we'll get to it. I just want to read you this passage. It's a famous one. All right. There also they divided the money received from the sale of the captives and the tithe which they set apart for Apollo and Artemis of the Ephesians was distributed among the generals. So they've taken all the money and a tenth of it they're setting apart for the gods that have helped them through this journey. But they're giving it to each of the generals, each taking his portion to keep safely for the gods. And the portion that fell to Chirisophus was given to Neon, the Asenean. That's not important. But so what, what's going on here is basically... The tithe is uh, to glorify the gods Artemis and Apollo, but the generals have this like moral and religious obligation. They get the money, they're just entrusted to them to give it to the gods in a fitting manner somehow. And the, the Artemis that they're dedicating this to is not just any Artemis, but the Artemis at Ephesus. And Ephesus is a city, a rich city on the coast of Asia Minor in Lydia, which is Cyrus's old territory, Cyrus of blessed memory. And this is a famous, famous temple. It's huge. It's like a Parthenon scale kind of place. It's actually world famous. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, actually. And I found this passage from a later Greek poet. Um, this is not in the Anabasis, but it's worth reading here just so you can get the context. And he said, I have gazed on the walls of impregnable Babylon, along which chariots may race, and on the Zeus by the banks of the Alpheus. I have seen the hanging gardens and the colossus of the Helios, the great man-made mountains of the lofty pyramids and the gigantic tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the sacred house of Artemis, that towers to the clouds. He's talking about the one at Ephesus. The others were placed in the shade, for the sun himself has never looked upon its equal outside Olympus, end quote. So that's what one person thought of Artemis at Ephesus and her temple. Uh, so just going on here, as for Xenophon, he caused, with his share, a votive offering to be made out of Apollo's share of his portion and dedicated it in the treasury of the Athenians at Delphi. This is much later. Delphi's in mainland Greece after the trip is over. So Xenophon's kind of telling you a little bit of the aftermath here. Uh, so he goes on. Inscribing upon it, on this dedication he made at Delphi, his own name and that of Proxenus, who was killed with Clearchus, for Proxenus was his friend going on here. The share which belonged to Artemis of the Ephesians he left behind at Ephesus at the time when he was returning from Asia with Agesilaus to take part in the campaign against Boeotia. The story that we've told in the life of Agesilaus now. 
for the reason that his own journey seemed likely to be a dangerous one. And so he's leaving the money with Artemis at Ephesus, with the actual temple guys there, uh, in case he doesn't survive what comes next. But if he does, his instructions were, if he did survive, that in case he should escape with his life, the money was to be returned to him. But in case any ill should befall him, Megabizus was to cause to be made and dedicated to Artemis, whatever offering he thought would please the goddess. So he's leaving this temple treasure in charge of, uh, in the charge of this guy, Megabizus, who's like a priest or a treasurer at the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Going on here, this is really important for understanding Xenophon. In the time of Xenophon's exile, and when he was living at Skilus near Olympia, where he had been established as a colonist by the Lacedaemonians, Megabizus came to Olympia to attend the games and return to him his deposit. So just to back this up here, Xenophon is writing all this stuff many years later, maybe in the 380s. And recall from the life of Agesilaus, if you haven't listened, basically Xenophon was good friends with Agesilaus, king of Sparta, who he met after all this, the, the end of this Anabasis story. And he campaigned with Agesilaus in Asia and in Greece. Xenophon gets exiled from Athens eventually. Uh, we don't hear about this story in the Anabasis, but we, we piece it together from this and that source, this being one of them. And so he's, he's installed in a place called Skilus, which is basically right by Olympia, as we'll see. And the Spartans have a lot of influence in this area. It's in the territory of Elis, which is one of their primary allies. And sometimes Elis, they're kind of wayward. And in some dispute, the Spartans confiscated some land from Elis, and they basically put Xenophon on it. And it kind of seems like you get the hint that he's, that it's a lot of land. <laughs> that maybe not like a ranch, but like Xenophon kind of becomes the local big man for an entire small city of Greece, which is like a, a less than an hour's walk away from Olympia. And I think this is just fascinating. So, and Olympia is, by the way, it's in the Peloponnese. It's kind of, it's kind of near Sparta. Uh, so this is fascinating. Listen, listen on to what Xenophon tells us. So his friend Megabizus from Ephesus later visited him when he was going to the Olympic Games, which is right in Xenophon's backyard. And Xenophon says, upon receiving it, the money, Xenophon bought a plot of ground for the goddess in a place which Apollo's oracle appointed. Uh, so he's he already owns or he at least lives on a great plot of land, but then he buys some more with this money and he dedicates it to the goddess Artemis. And he's going to describe what he does for us. As it chanced, there flowed through the plot a river named Selenus, and at Ephesus likewise, a Selenus river flows past the temple of Artemis. Side note here, Selenus means celery, or something like that. In both streams, moreover, there are fish and mussels, while in the plot at Skilus, there is hunting of all manner of beasts of the chase. Skilus is where Xenophon is. Here, Xenophon built an altar and a temple with the sacred money, and from that time forth, he would every year take the tithe of the products of the land, the tenth, that is, in their season, and offer sacrifice to the goddess, all the citizens and the men and women of the neighborhood taking part in the festival. And the goddess would provide for the banqueters barley meal and loaves of bread, wine and sweet meats, and a portion of the sacrificial victims from the sacred herd, as well as of the victims taken in the chase. So the goddess is sort of, you know, as the owner of this land, she's, she's hosting these people for this festival. For Xenophon's sons and the sons of the other citizens used to have a hunting expedition at the time of the festival, and any grown men who so wished would join them. And they captured their game, partly from the sacred precinct itself and partly from Mount Foloe, boars and gazelles and stags. Wow, doesn't that sound nice? Going on here. The place is situated on the road which leads from Lacedaemon, Sparta, to Olympia and is about 20 stadia from the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. 
The Temple of Zeus, by the way, at Olympia, also another of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Going on, within that sacred precinct that Xenophon bought for Artemis, there is meadowland and tree-covered hills, suited for the rearing of swine, goats, cattle, and horses, so that even the draft animals which bring people to the festival have their feast also. Immediately surrounding the temple is a grove of cultivated trees. So he's talking about he builds a little temple on this land. So there's a grove of trees around it cultivated, producing all sorts of dessert fruits in their season. The temple itself is like the one at Ephesus, although small as compared with great. And the image of the goddess, although cypress wood as compared with gold, is like the Ephesian image. It was a very distinctive cult statue of Artemis. And I'll put a link to the picture in the show notes. Beside the temple stands a tablet with the inscription, The place is sacred to Artemis. He who holds it and enjoys its fruits must offer the tithe every year in sacrifice, and from the remainder must keep the temple in repair. If anyone leave these things undone, the goddess will care. End quote. So, I once heard Tim Ferriss speaking on a podcast, and he was saying, somebody asked him about his real estate investment strategy. And he said, I don't have anything in particular as far as like ROI and, you know, whatever investors look at as far as metrics, but I like to own property in places where smart people want to visit and or live. In a way, Xenophon is kind of doing this. I mean, he's, you know, he's been installed in a prime place of real estate by the Spartans. He's basically living in this place where the richest and most famous and yes, smartest Greeks want to visit on a regular basis. And you kind of get the sense that with this description here in the Anabasis, Xenophon is, he's kind of inviting you to come pay him a visit. He's telling you how nice it is. You know, he noted, well, anybody who happens to be in the area gets to participate in this annual hunt. Nudge, nudge. So I think this is just a fascinating little window into, into Xenophon, the man of leisure, the, the gentleman, what he does after all this happens. Okay, so moving on. And uh, now I'm realizing that they actually sold the slaves at Carasus, which is like three days march west from Trapezus, but it's not that important. Okay, so they leave Carasus, really just still beginning their journey. And the next territory over that they have to go through on land while they're waiting for Chirisophus is the territory of a people that the Greeks call the Masanoikians, which literally means wood tower dwellers. And uh, as they're on the borders there of the Masanoikians, they get a representative there meeting them to try to talk to them. And it's actually a Greek guy from Trapezus there, who is the ambassador of the Masanoikians. And he's a very interesting guy. He, I mean, we don't know anything about him, but he, you know, you get the sense that he's kind of gone semi-native. He speaks as their interpreter. And so they ask this guy, his name is uh, Tim, Timosethius, and they ask him, well, we'd like to pass through here. We mean no harm. And he says, no, the Masanoikians won't let you. I'm sorry. And so they're, they're kind of sad. But then he gives them some very interesting information. And I'm going to read you here a passage. Then Timosethius told the Greeks that the Masanoikians who dwelt further on were hostile to them that is, to the ones that they're on the borders of. And it was decided to summon those other Masanoikians and see whether they wanted to conclude an alliance. So Timosethius was sent to them and brought back with him their chiefs. So this is the old, find an enemy of your enemy if you want to uh, get something done trick. So going on here, 
When they arrived, these chiefs of the Masanoikians and the generals of the Greeks met together, and Xenophon spoke as follows, Timosethius acting as interpreter. Masanoikians, we desire to make our way to Greece in safety by land, for we have no ships. But these people, who, as we hear, are your enemies, are blocking our passage. If you wish, therefore, it is within your power to secure us as allies, to exact vengeance for any wrong these people have ever done you, and to make them henceforth your subjects. But if you dismiss us with a refusal, where, bethink you, could you ever again secure so large a force to help you fight your battles? To these words, the chief of the Masanoikians replied that they desired this arrangement and accepted the alliance. Well then, said Xenophon, what use will you want to make of us if we become your allies? And what assistance will you in turn be able to render us in the matter of our passage through this territory? They replied, we are able to invade this land of your enemies and ours from the opposite side and to send to you here not only ships, but men who will aid you in the fighting and will guide you on your way. So that seems to work out pretty well. You know, they've got the chieftains there at their camp and uh, they, they've just struck a deal. It seems like they're going to get through. And Xenophon goes on immediately to tell you what happens next. After confirming this arrangement by giving and receiving pledges, they departed. The next day, they returned, bringing with them 300 canoes, each made out of a single log, and each containing three men, two of whom disembarked and fell into line under arms, while the third remained in the canoe. Then the latter took their canoes and sailed back again, and those who stayed behind marshaled themselves in the following way. They took position in lines of about a hundred each, like choral dancers ranged opposite one another, all of them with wicker shields covered with white shaggy ox hide and like an ivy leaf in shape, and each man holding in his right hand a lance about six cubits long, that's about 12 feet, maybe, with a spearhead at one end and a round ball at the butt end of the other shaft. I take it that that's to balance out this exceedingly long spear, they wore short tunics which did not reach their knees and were as thick as a linen bag for bedclothes, whatever that is, but you can imagine, and upon their heads leather helmets just such as the Paphlagonian helmets with a tuft in the middle very like a tiara in shape and they also had iron battle axes. And after they had formed their lines, one of them led off and the rest after him, every man of them, fell into a rhythmic march and song, and passing through the battalions and through the quarters of the Greeks, they went straight on against the enemy, toward a stronghold which seemed to be especially assailable. I love this. They know exactly where they're going. <laughs> just moving on here since it's just so, I think it's so clear. It was situated in front of the city, this stronghold that they're going after, which is called by them their metropolis and contains the chief citadel of the Masanoikians. In fact, it was for the possession of this citadel that the war was going on. For those who at any time held it were deemed to be masters of all the other Masanoikians. And they said that the present occupants did not hold it by right, but that it was common property and they had seized it in order to gain a selfish advantage. Continuing on here, so they have a little raid here. These Masanoikians, they see that they can attack this citadel, and uh, maybe if they take this stronghold, that they can, uh, you know, seize control of the whole Masanoikian region, I guess. It's like this stronghold city, or the, so there's like a city and a stronghold, and it's not really clear what the relationship between, but they're close, and... It seems like if you take one that you have a pretty good shot of taking the other and they decide to make a make a go at it and probably they're encouraged by the fact that some of the Greeks decide to join up with them without importantly being ordered to as Xenophon makes very clear to state the attacking party was followed by some of the Greeks not under orders from their generals but seeking plunder 
little foreshadowing about what's going to happen there. As they approached, the enemy for a time kept quiet, but when they had got near the stronghold, they sallied forth and put them to flight, killing a considerable number of the barbarians and some of the Greeks who had gone up the hill with them and pursuing the rest until they saw the Greeks coming to the rescue. Then they turned and fell back, and after cutting off the heads of the dead men, this is the Masanoikians in the fort, uh, after cutting off the heads of the dead men, displayed them to the Greeks and to their own enemies. At the same time, dancing to a kind of strain which they sang. Wow. So they do a war dance there, dangling these severed heads. Uh, and the Greeks, continuing on here, the Greeks, this is the, the whole army, he means, the Greeks were exceedingly angry, not only because the enemy had been made bolder, but because the Greeks who went to attack with the barbarians, these ones who were just out for plunder, they had taken to flight though in very considerable numbers. A thing which had never happened, that they had never done before in the course of the expedition. It's kind of a morale hit for the rest of the army, and they're, they're upset about it. Uh, so Xenophon encourages them. Uh, they end up forming and having a proper attack with the whole army. The Mosinoikians and the Citadel put up a pretty hard fight, but here's what happens. Quote, as the Greeks, however, refused to give way, but kept pushing on to close quarters, the barbarians took to flight from that point also, every man of them having abandoned the fortress. Their king in his wooden tower, built upon the citadel, whom all the people jointly maintain while he remains there on guard, refused to come forth, as did also the commander of the stronghold, as did also the commander of the stronghold which had been captured earlier. So they were burned up where they were, along with their towers. Well, so much for that tribe of the Masanoikians. Moving on here, we're going to come to what's become one of my favorite selections in these chapters, that of sampling the local delicacies. Quote, In plundering the strongholds, the Greeks found in the houses stores as the Masanoikians described them, of heaped up loaves from last year's grain, while the new grain was laid away with the straw, most of it being spelt. They also found slices of dolphin salted away in jars, and in other vessels, dolphin blubber, which the Masanoikians used in the same way as the Greeks use olive oil, and on the upper floors of the houses, there were large quantities of flat nuts without any divisions. Out of these nuts, by boiling them and baking them into loaves, they made the bread, which they used the most. The Greeks also found wine, which by reason of its harshness appeared to be sharp when taken unmixed, but mixed with water was fragrant and delicious. End quote. So they hand over the fortress to the Masanoikians. And uh, just another note here that I thought was interesting. The greater part of these places were of the following description. The towns were 80 stadia distant from each other. That's about eight miles. Some more and some less. But the inhabitants could hear one another shouting from one town to the next. Such heights and valleys there were in the country. And when the Greeks, as they proceeded, were among the friendly Masanoikians... They would exhibit to them fattened children of the wealthy inhabitants who had been nourished on boiled nuts and were soft and white to an extraordinary degree and pretty nearly equal in length and breadth with their backs adorned with many colors and their foreparts all tattooed with flower patterns. These Masanoikians wanted also to have intercourse openly with the women who accompanied the Greeks, for that was their own fashion. <sighs> That's at least what they're telling them, right? It is uh, customary in our lands when a stranger passes through that they, uh... Anyway, and all of them were white, the men and women alike. The Greeks are white too, but I think he means kind of pasty here. They were said by the Greeks who served on the expedition to be the most uncivilized people whose country they traversed, the furthest removed from Greek customs, 
for they habitually did in public the things that other people would only do in private. And when they were alone, they would behave just as if they were in the company of others, talking to themselves, laughing at themselves, and dancing in whatever spot they chanced to be, as though they were giving an exhibition to others. So that was a passage in particular that made me think of Diogenes the Cynic somehow. And so they move a little further on up the coast, and they end up at a place called Katiora, which is another one of these Greek outposts. Um, it's a colony of a colony. It's a colony of Sinope. Um, and I'll skip over a lot here and summarize it by essentially saying that there is a misunderstanding. Katiora, the people there, they don't want to let these soldiers in. They don't want to admit the sick uh, and wounded among the army. And some threats are exchanged. Some big words are spoken. And Xenophon ends up speaking on their behalf. And I think the main thing that becomes clear from this is everyone is nervous. Everyone who's not in the army is nervous about this big army being in their territory. It's understandable, right? They don't want to get plundered. They're afraid of getting pushed around. But the army has this huge negotiating leverage as long as they are able to stay together. They've been fighting constantly for a year or so now. They're battle-hardened guys. They've got no fear. And Xenophon really uses this in his plea, if you could call it that, to the Katiorans to, let's, you know, play nice. And really all he has to do is show them a little bit of biceps here. And the locals get, all of a sudden, very friendly. Uh, but once again, the biggest problem that they have, that Xenophon has as a leader, is this chaos on the horizon. Uh, the threat of them breaking up and going their separate ways. And then these smaller groups getting kind of eaten up or defeated or enslaved or whatever by local powers. But Xenophon manages to work out for them a kind of peaceable situation at Katiora. And they agree to help out the Greeks. Uh, but around this time, Xenophon is starting to get optimistic and he's filled with, well, he starts to get big ideas and this kicks off a kind of a conflict. Here he is again. Quote, At this time, as Xenophon's eyes rested upon a great body of Greek hoplites and likewise upon a great body of peltasts, those light-armed troops, bowmen, slingers, and horsemen also, all of them now exceedingly efficient through constant service and all there in Pontus where so large a force could not have been gathered by any slight outlay of money. It seemed to him that it was a fine thing to gain additional territory and power for Greece by founding a city. It would become a great city, he thought, as he reckoned up their own numbers and the peoples who dwelt around the Euxine, around the Black Sea, he means, that's their word for it, the Euxine. And with a view to this project, before speaking about it to any of the soldiers, he offered up sacrifices, summoning for that purpose Silenus, the Ambraciot, who had been the soothsayer of Cyrus, and so on and so on. Uh, and so Xenophon does eventually share this idea with a few people, and he makes a proposal to the soldiers that they go and found a city. This is going on at the time. The Greeks are colonizing these areas. This is what the Katiorans did. This is what the Sinopians did. This is what uh, the Trapezuntians have done. And uh, Xenophon's like, well, why don't we do it too? Wouldn't that be good for Greece? Wouldn't that be good for us? You know, we could found a city. We could. His idea is basically not necessarily to settle there, but to you know, have a have their own land in this beautiful, wild, mountainous area and maybe kind of go back and forth between their hometowns. Anyway, this proposal goes around and the plan after it gets around to some of the soldiers is actually not very popular for whatever reason. And it becomes, unfortunately, a huge opportunity for Xenophon's haters and detractors and jealous people to get a wedge in his detractors among the army, I mean. And not just that, but also opportunists. And they start telling all these plausible stories about how, for example, Xenophon doesn't want to pay the bill for the services that he's 
received from local Katiorans. They've, you know, incurred some debts there. And some people just kind of go off and they start making threats to the locals. Well, you better give us a bunch of stuff or the army is going to ravage your territory and then plunder it. And we're going to go found our own city and you're just going to be stuck paying the bill. And it just gets to be really messy. And, and all these other stories start floating around. And we'll skip the details here, but I think what emerges from this situation is this is a reminder that there are times when you should not share a hypothetical plan with an entire organization before you've A, thought it through very carefully, and B, probably already committed to it. So Xenophon has to give a series of speeches in which he does a lot of tedious backtracking and it he has to explain how his intentions were noble and he didn't want to do it without the support of the army and he didn't mean it to be used as an opportunity to defraud or abuse any local cities and it's very embarrassing but it's also a lesson in crisis management and uh, the way Xenophon handles it is he just calmly takes the time he stands up and gives a speech and he takes the time to explain to lay out all the facts very calmly explains through this process, the source of the misunderstanding. And then he turns and he reminds them that they're in a strong position. Okay, let's abandon the whole city founding plan since you guys don't don't like it. Uh, we've still got a lot going for us. We're strong if we stick together. And this continues to be the most important point. And as an illustration of this point and of the danger they face if they don't stick together, Xenophon address as he's addressing these soldiers and defending himself he brings up a certain matter that has come to his attention and he tells this story it essentially some subordinate leaders of their army have been taking off little bands of guys to make raids contrary to their explicit agreement you recall they all agreed if anybody should set off they should tell the whole army where they're going who they're taking etc for the reasons we've discussed um, but some people have been going off and making raids, and one group of kind of independent freebooter pirate raiders went off, and they were hoping to get some plunder while the taking was easy, and there was some betrayal involved. They had an agreement with the local community, and these guys went against that. Well, this group of guys get, end up getting killed, and the local townsfolk complain, and Xenophon has to very embarrassingly apologize said he had no idea about the whole thing and he begs the townsfolk uh, to basically be so kind as to bury these men who had attacked them and he cites this to illustrate the kind of problems they're facing i think this passage here is really interesting i'm going to read for you here it shows the stakes of the situation and he's laying them out for the troops for a very good reason and he says this is him speaking and addressing the troops Quote, now if these things are right, this whole freebooting stuff, do you so resolve in order that with the understanding that such deeds are to be done, a man may establish his own private guard and may endeavor to hold possession of the strong places overhanging him on the right when he encamps? In other words, well, if you guys think this is a good idea, why don't we make that our policy? The details about the geography there are not important. Now, if, however... You think that such deeds are those of wild beasts and not of human beings. Look about for some means of stopping them. Otherwise, how in the name of Zeus shall we offer glad sacrifices to the gods when we are doing impious deeds? Or how shall we fight with our enemies if we are slaying one another? And what friendly city will receive us when it sees so great lawlessness amongst us? Who will dare to supply us with the market if in matters of the greatest import we show ourselves guilty of such offenses? You know, betraying agreements with locals to remain peaceable and so forth. And in that land where we were fancying that we would obtain praise from everyone, who would praise us if we are men of this sort? For we ourselves, I am quite sure, should say that people who perform such deeds are scoundrels. So essentially he says, we have to be just. And he implies here kind of, we have to be religious men. We have to honor our oaths, our pledges. 
religion is a way that they sanction oaths. You know, you, you, you pour out a libation to a god who's supposed to certify the oath. Religion, in the eyes of the Greeks, is really the main source of international law, which is all the more important in an area like this, which is kind of lawless beyond the walls of a city. And uh, he goes on here, and I think that this next little bit is cool. He shows the soldier's response. Uh, it shows that they have this kind of collective moral compass. Quote, Hereupon all rose and proposed that the men who began this affair should be duly punished, and that henceforth no one should be again permitted to make a beginning of lawlessness. But if any should so begin, they were to be put on trial for their lives, and the generals were to bring all offenders to trial, and trials were likewise to be held in the matter of any other offenses which anyone had committed since the time when Cyrus was killed. And they appointed captains to serve as a jury. Further, upon the recommendation of Xenophon, and by the advice of the soothsayers, it was resolved to purify the army, so rites of purification were performed, end quote. Well, he convinces them, you know, that, that they need to kind of have a come to Zeus moment, if you will. And they agree. And so they have these uh, religious rites of purification that usually will involve a piglet. You find a piglet and you sprinkle its, you know, sacrifice it, sprinkle its blood all around the uh, thing that you want to purify, if I remember correctly. Uh, so uh, the army's pure now. And I think there's a takeaway here uh, just about the whole justice thing. This is the importance of being just and understanding justice, especially when there's like moral gray areas, say in areas uh, where the, you know, securities laws aren't exactly clear. And, you know, I mean, international waters there's all kinds of situations that you run into whether in business or politics or life where you know the the borders of, and the the authority in charge is not necessarily very strong and at these moments especially it's important to know justice because justice is kind of like a compass floating in oil you know you can shake up a compass an old fashioned kind of compass but eventually it's going to float and point into the right direction and as a leader you know people get confused but as a leader it's your it's your job to figure out what that direction is quicker than everybody else and to lead your people in that direction because that's the best long-term bet in the end it's going to be the least resistance to go in the direction of true north towards justice okay so after all this there's a final passage I'm going to read for you that I think you're going to like. Accusations, reading here, accusations were also made against Xenophon by certain men who claimed that he was beating them. And they were making the accusation on the grounds that he was acting out of arrogance. Hubris is the Greek word, which is a legal term uh, for kind of like wanton disregard for what you might call human rights, but I wouldn't. But anyway, it's it's sort of like, it's like saying Xenophon committed a hate crime on me or something. Not that it means literally that, but it has a lot of uh, moral and ideological force behind it to say he's, he's committing hubris. Well, Xenophon bade the first man who spoke to state where it was that Xenophon had struck him. And the man replied, in the place where we were perishing with cold and there was an enormous amount of snow. And Xenophon said, Well, really, with weather of the sort you describe and provisions used up and no chance even to get a smell of wine, when many of us were becoming exhausted with hardships and the enemy were at our heels, if at such a time as that I wantonly abused you, I used hubris upon you, is the Greek there, I admit that I am more wanton even than the ass who, because of its wantonness, so the saying runs, is not subject to fatigue. Nevertheless, do tell us, he said, for what reason you were struck. And uh, I think you get the sense here that Xenophon was a little bit confused at first by this accusation, and he's kind of buying himself some time here. So 
Did I ask you for something and then strike you because you would not give it to me? Did I demand something back? Was it in a fight over a boy? Was it an act of drunken violence? When the man replied that it was none of these things, Xenophon asked him if he was a hoplite. Those are the highest status soldiers. And the guy says no. Was he a pelt assed then? No, not that either, he said, but he was driving a mule assigned to that post by his messmates, although he was a free man. So uh, he's, he's doing a sort of dishonorable work in the, uh, in the army there. And Xenophon kind of brings this out by, really, you might call it a Socratic questioning. He's kind of drawing on his uh, training there that he got with Socrates uh, with this kind of uh, question and answer getting down to the bottom of the matter. Okay, at that, Xenophon recognized him. Aha! The buying of time has finally paid off. He recognized him. And he asked, Are you the fellow who carried off the sick man? Yes, by Zeus, he replied. For you forced me to do so, and you scattered my messmate's baggage all about. Why, the scattering, said Xenophon, was after this fashion. I distributed the baggage among others to carry and directed them to bring it back to me. And when I got back, I returned the whole of it to you, intact, when you, for your part, had shown me the sick man. I'm not sure what the arrangement was there, but, you know, Xenophon says that, uh, you know, I was doing something reasonable. And he continues, But listen, all of you, he's talking to the soldiers here, and hear how the affair happened, for the story is worth hearing. And I'll just keep reading on here. A man was being left behind because he was unable to keep going any longer. I was acquainted with the man only so far as to know that he was one of our number. And I forced you, sir, to carry him in order that he might not perish. For as I remember, the enemy were following after us. To that the fellow agreed. Well, Xenophon continued, after I had sent you on ahead, I overtook you again as I came along with the rear guard, and found you digging a hole to bury the man in. And I stopped and commended you. But when, as we were standing by, the man drew up his leg, all of us cried out, The man is alive! I'm not dead. Denifon didn't write that, but that's what it made me think of. And he goes on here addressing this mule driver fellow. And you said... Let him be alive, just as much as he pleases. I, for my part, am not going to carry him. Then I struck you. Your story is true, for it looked to me as if you knew that he was alive. Well, what of that? the fellow said. Didn't he die all the same after I had shown him to you? Why, said Xenophon, all of us are likewise going to die. But should we on that account be buried alive? As for this fellow, everybody cried out that Xenophon had given him fewer blows than he deserved. And so, in short, this goes on a little while longer. Uh, Xenophon defending himself, and he, he says, You know, if I beat any of you, it was for your own good. It was tough love. How about that? And uh, after this, a number of guys stand up and talk about how Xenophon did them a good turn here and there. And it all works out. And the soldiers acquit Xenophon, so to speak. And with that, book five ends on a high note for Xenophon. But still, they're there in the neighborhood of Katiora, this Greek outpost. And still no sign of Chirisophus. Still two more books to go, and it's a long way home. So join us next time for episode six or uh, book six of this series of notes on Xenophon's Anabasis. If you like this, remember to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Stay strong, stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time. <laughs>